So although this was, that was just a, sh a very small case study of films, I hope that it gave you a sense of how um, filmmakers, and in the case of um, Hirosh Hiroshi Sugimoto, photography has been used to capture anima animals via visual and moving images. So now we're going to move on to the Q&A section of the talk. Um, I will be chairing the ses session and if I could make sure all your mics are turned off and if you want to ask a question please could you raise your hand um, as demonstrating um, or, or alternatively if you could just type a question into the chat box um, and I'll ask it for, for you. Um, so I'm just going to start rather selfishly by asking a few questions myself to Jim and Lucy. Um, so thinking of the films, Jim, I wondered if there was anything in particular that stood out for you, um, especially I was thinking in terms of camera trap, as I know that you have a wildlife camera and various recording devices in your garden, <laughs> which I hope you're happy to share, share with everyone. Yeah, that's no problem. Um, it, obviously, the camera trap film um, uh, struck a chord with me. Uh, as I'll uh, flesh out a bit of detail first. Uh, I have a very small garden in uh, Scarborough's old town and I have a camera trap in there which I bought for my birthday last month, uh, well, earlier this month. Um, and uh, so far we've had the neighbour's cats. That's all we've had on it so far. Um, but I was inspired because my, um, my dad's got one um, in his garden just outside Hull and they get foxes and he gets mice and hedgehogs and all sorts of things um but it's a really interesting window into a um that nocturnal world that you would never find out if you go looking in your garden at night anything that's there is going to clear off but this uh gives you a window into it uh i also run a moth trap so uh, i find out what moths are in my garden and for the past few days i've been pointing a uh shotgun microphone into the sky uh, at night and recording any birds that are flying over. I've uh, been having quite a few common sandpipers flying over, which I never knew about uh, on account of being asleep. But yeah, they're, they're there and I'm recording them. Um, so uh, you never know what's there. And the interesting thing about these films is that it gives you an insight into things that you can't observe as a person. Um, remote camera traps uh, have been used really successfully with things like snow leopards which are very very secretive creatures, they live in really remote places and previous attempts to look at what they were doing have, have proved to be really difficult because as soon as you go into the habitat um, they disappear uh, they're very cautious and wary, wary animals um, so when you have these remote tracking devices and remote sensing of any sort, including uh, radio collars, even simple things like bird ringing and things like that, you get a whole lot of information that you can't get otherwise and you can't get through uh, observing in standard ways. Um, one of the things uh, about Bear 71 that I liked and disliked was I, I didn't like the, um, the sort of anthropomorphic view of it but the story it told was only, they were only able to tell that story because the fact that they tracked it and they picked it up on the remote cameras and things like that. Um, despite the fact it was, in, in, at times, it was almost dismissive about the, the interventions that had happened. Um, but the, um, the only way they can tell that story and find out how animals behave away from humans is by using remote sensing. So it's, a, it's an interesting one. Um, but yeah, so, yeah, the uh, camera trap and, and uh, Bear 71, I like that. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting to hear, and interesting to hear how obviously you can use it and, because I think use that kind of technology ourselves. Um, and Lucy, moving on to you, I wondered what you thought about the films or anything that struck you in particular. I think um, Bear 71 was very emotive. I think, yeah, it's an interesting point about that mixing of an imagined perspective or getting inside the head of a bear. What would they be thinking while they're um, exploring or protecting their cubs? And, and that with the kind of actual 
evidence of where where they've been so it's like kind of fact and fiction overlap and being able to kind of manipulate the story could reach a greater audience by doing it and the techniques are used are very effective um i was also but that idea of um viewing the the way it was described as viewing the like other people that they see that kind of looking at humans uh, looking at us as a species and how that came across in zoo as well that idea of um some of the the shots um how the uh, visitors to the zoo looked like they were in cages themselves like with the amount of different kind of barriers i was quite i was noticing like the vertical bars or the crisscross mesh or those kind of different dividing lines that you get between you know us and other species um but how that exists with our shared behaviors i do you mentioned about the barriers in zoo as well between the kind of human human animal human is interesting as with viewing the all these films via a screen as well and i'm talking to you via a screen and whether that is a barrier to um our interactions with nature and animals or whether it is kind of a way that kind of opens us up to see things so whether it's a positive barrier if that makes sense um and I wondered whether we could talk a bit about the natural history collections within the museum because obviously um, you saw a bit of Sugimo's photographs um, and the way he would capture the dioramas in the Natural History Museum in America. Um, and obviously the way that the taxidermid specimens are displayed in Scarborough Museums are slightly different. Um, as they're shown within the archive and not many people could interact with them. So I wondered if you could talk a bit about uh, about that, Jim. Um, and Lucy, I know you've been down to the collections as an observer, um, and I wondered what struck you about seeing them in an archive situation? Yeah, it's, um, the way museums deal with natural history has changed a lot um, over the centuries. Uh, and more especially so maybe in the last 20 years or so. Um, when people used to go to museums to see, especially natural history museums, what they wanted to see was the dioramas, as is mentioned, uh, and reconstructions of uh, what the animals looked like in life, which is why taxidermy was so popular. It was, um, it was that dramatic, um, stuffing of an animal kind of thing for want of a better term um that showed uh that showed to people what what it would look like if you saw it in the wild whereas nowadays um that's not really what people want to see if you want to see animals in the wild there's so many brilliant documentaries um david attenborough a great hero of all of us no doubt um and uh, I was watching Primates the other night. These um, films show you what the animals are like in nature far better than any diorama can. And a lot of the taxidermy specimens you find in museums, you have no provenance as to where they came from. They were purely collected for display. Um, but the majority of museum specimens of uh, natural history are things like study skins. Um, for those who don't know, study skin is uh, a bird, primarily, but also mammals, they do, that has just literally been skinned and um, minimal stuffing put inside it just to pad it out a bit. Uh, but you have all the collection data as to where it came from, uh, when it was collected, uh, but all that kind of information. And scientists use those for studying. Um, variation within species if you know exactly where something was collected uh, you can take the biometric measurements from it the wing length that kind of thing color um, but also nowadays you can take dna specimens from it uh, and find out a little about um, variation within a species um, a classic example linked to that slightly is uh, insect collections. In the Scarborough Museum, we have about 80,000 uh, insects. And with, with them, you have a little card pinned underneath them that tells you where and when it was collected. Uh, now, from a very tiny piece of the leg of one of those insects, 
you can collect enough DNA to tell you, uh, to give you the uh, DNA profile of it. And with things, when you have a record of a species where it's just written down, um, you can't go back to it to check that that's right. If you have the specimen itself, uh, you can you can go back to it, check it nowadays, do DNA tests to see whether the identification is correct. The other thing is um, there was a type of moth that occurs in America on cactuses, and they had written records of it. They had museum specimens, and then somebody discovered it was actually six different species, not one. Uh, now all the written records for that instantly become void because you don't know which of the six species that record is referring to. If you have the physical specimen, you can go and look at it under a microscope normally, um, or take the DNA and find out exactly which of the six species it was. And therefore you can look at the distribution and what habitat, because obviously if it's a different species, it has different, mm. it fills a slightly different niche. Um, so what are the pressures on it as a species, that kind of thing, it's, it's an, an, an interesting, uh, and difficult thing because often people say um why why collect yeah i think that's interesting how they become a lot more of a i guess a scientific resource as well rather than kind of as taxidermy i'm talking about here than public yeah. play so lucy you as a kind as an artist and designer i wonder how you have thought with and are currently thinking about um, natural history collections or nature in your own practice previously and going forward? Well, um, it was quite interesting going back to visit the Rotunda because I'd worked on that as an exhibition project uh, in 2006 and um, I hadn't actually ever got around to seeing the actual display and I was rather struck by the caption next to the Great Bustard um, and the fact it was you know, one of the last mating pairs um, that um, in the UK. And then it was quite interesting then, like kind of, it, it leads you to ask questions about these these species and, you know, who was, who was her partner? And then seeing the partner on a shelf in the stores in lockdown, almost, well, before lockdown, but that kind of idea of these two, uh, this kind of mating pair of birds separated in two different venues, one being on display and one being in the store. And I suppose it, all these questions about what 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 gets selected to be on display versus and how is it selected and how are they these things presented um i think that was quite interesting seeing the also seeing the store the way the animals are displayed was very creative um just kind of these accidental you know jaguars which i thought was a leopard you know looking like it's about to eat a fox and it's kind of like these Recently, I've been thinking obviously about the animals in the store and in lockdown, like these kind of animals, maybe that, you know, want some quiet time and, you know, how does that work when they're all in a room together and kind of thinking about these taxidermy species as in a slightly different way, kind of, um, yeah, in a slightly unusual way, probably. But um, yeah, I think um, in terms of my own practice, though, I've been kind of fascinated by foxes for a long time and um, how imagining their different perspectives. So there was a story of a fox that went up to the top of the, sh the shard um, and just like, what did that fox see when they were up there? And I've then been thinking about, um, you know, how urban foxes would be affected by climate change and how they might have to adapt living underneath, you know, a basement shed or something. And what, what, what are the future, what's the future for foxes? Um, within a changing climate and that's kind of now expanding into you know other species and thinking about how how they could adapt or how we need to or how we need to adapt for them yeah. that's really interesting um simon did you have a question uh, hang on. Um, can you hear me yes yes Hello everyone. Um, I um, wasn't absent. I was actually in the other room and I'd managed to stream uh, the Zoom to my uh, great big flat screen telly. Sorry to be so gauche. Um, so Lucy, it was really interesting um, 
just listening to, um, yeah, I suppose, sorry, for, for those who don't know who I am, what I do, I basically do spend a lot of my life in the stores around the um, taxidermy in particular, and some of my uh, favourite um, items in the collection are from the taxidermy, uh, specifically from uh, the Harrison collection, uh, which I'm sure Jim would explain if he hasn't already. Um, so it, it's, it, it is a very odd thing, and I did have the very great privilege recently to take my nine-year-old son, yes, I know, um, into the store. And of course, the first thing he wanted to see were the, you know, the dead things um, and, and skeletons and weapons in that actual order so i and, and he had on his uh, on the top of his list the uh, the sloth uh, and we've got um you know we've got just this amazing collection of taxidermy a lot of which had come from harrison a lot of which has been lost as martha was referring to earlier um so when he was confronted with the archive racks which are these big windy walls you know that you open up to save space and and they're on um, plaster so you know archive materials etc and they're all uh, mostly out of their case which is is a kind of odd thing in itself because the cases themselves w were and are very beautiful and some of which that we've retained are, are fantastic so most of those larger animals are outside of the case just on racks that you wind open and he was just amazed that these animals were together on the racks and you had a you know snow a you know, big huge tiger next to a leopard next to my personal favorite the aardvark and and the glapcus tortoise and so on and that he thought that this was a really constructed display something that was designed to be seen and actually the the reality in a weird way is that it's not it's not designed to be seen and it very rarely is actually seen um yeah. and after yeah. he i think it's an interesting question the simon the idea of sorry to i'm just conscious of time and just opening up for other people to speak but i was really like the idea of how it was the archives although it's a largely invisible space i know you took like you said you took your son down there you spend a lot of time there jim spends a lot of time there how these animals exist in this kind of largely invisible space but they are ordered in some way um but ordered in a way that um prescribes our interaction with them which i think is really curious um and one thing that i was struck with with these films and obviously taxidermy taxidermy and museum collections of natural history in general is what is the future of them do we do we want to see them how do we want to see them um and i wondered maybe as um a last question from me before i open it up um what do you two think jim and lucy what do you think is the future of natural history in the museum setting is it over um and how do we think about it going forward lucy did you want to start i think um one of the displays that i was quite i didn't get to see it but um in bristol museums um last year i think it was called extinction voices um and i think it's curator isla gladstone she basically covered all of their, um, I think there were species that were either um, at risk of extinction or like high risk uh, species with these black veils. So that was that kind of curator intervention, I think is what's needed um, in terms of making us view um, or encouraging us to view these, you know, different species in different ways. Um, and that's you know one example and there's many other ways that people and museums are trying to kind of reconfigure the human and animal relationship and kind of make us consider how similar we are or behaviors and um, just trying to encourage empathy and i think that's really important um, and agency as well so i think that's i think the role that museums have with them 
mm. collections. Yeah, I think that concept of empathy is really interesting in museums. And I think the idea of visitors being an active, um, an active element of the experience and having, yeah, being active both visually, but also emotionally, I think is really important. Uh, Jim, how about you? Well, um, as a, a, a lifelong naturalist, uh, I may be a touch bias, um, but I think the, um, the time of natural history is actually now. Um, it was, it's always been looked at as something um, of a, a Georgian Victorian pastime, but it's more popular now than it ever has been. And one of the reasons for that is um, the internet has been, it. people are able to share information. Um, if you've ever looked at a, a, an insect, for example, uh, of which there are 28,000 species of insects in this country, um, and you don't know what it is, if you had to go through all the books to find out what it was, you would have no chance. Whereas now you can post it onto um, a Facebook group and you'll probably get uh, at least uh, a family identification straight away, which is encouraging people uh, to get out there and start recording things. And a lot of the um, species recording groups are getting huge amounts of data now uh, from people who have got, everybody's got a uh, camera on the phone. So people are taking photographs of things, what's this? And, and the data is being collected. So I think, as I say, the, the, the time of natural history is now. Um, and museum collections are hugely important in that um, because they're a repository for uh, this information and even things like the photographs but also specimens because with some insects you cannot be identified unless you take a specimen um, and these are then kept for future generations and you can go back to these things and look at them uh, with fresh eyes in 10, 15, 100 years time. So I think uh, museums and natural history are hugely important uh, in this day and age. Yeah, yeah, I think that's interesting. And I think it's how we adapt, how we've adapted, adapted to use them um, to think about preserving um, not only the specimens themselves but future species as well and helping us learn how to um yeah care for them in the wild in the wild spaces um by using specimens i read about that being done as well um so now i'm going to open up to questions from um the virtual audience um and i'm going to start with one from kate that we have in the comments um and it kind of builds a bit Lucy, you mentioned it briefly about thinking about, I'm bringing up the dreaded C word, but thinking about um, animals in lockdown and um, how, I'm paraphrasing slightly, Kate, your question, but um, thinking about this um, event theme in relation to the current, um, I guess, lockdown and crisis and how it's kind of changed our relationship maybe with animals and thinking about them. Um, firstly, in terms of, I guess, um, we've seen we've seen those shots on on television with the goats coming to that Welsh village um, and that aspect. And also um, there's been talk of our relationship with animals almost causing it as well. So I wonder whether um, you think that it's changed our relationship with animals and nature um, going forward and currently um, Lucy I wonder whether you could speak about that. Yeah I think um, I mean I've certainly been um, observing nature in a greater way than before like just taking photos whilst running I mean I wasn't running before this so <laughs> that's that's one thing um, and just kind of particularly the different species around the world and things like jellyfish in, in Venice um, that you can see now and just how air pollution. I think it raises a lot of questions and it's like how, what's, what's next is certainly on my, on my mind, but how we can, uh, how we can respect and nature, like whether this will have the impact that, that um, in a, to change systems in a different way. I think that's certainly what's on my mind change them for the better um, in the mm. long run, obviously. Jim, did you have a comment at all? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, it's something that a lot of people are saying is how under lockdown people are, uh, we're seeing more wildlife, we're, we're hearing more things. Mm -hmm. And I am one of these people who constantly is looking and listening for things. And I'm not seeing more in, uh, I think, more due to the weather than anything else. I'm actually seeing less than I would expect to see at this time of year. But um, because it's so quiet and we've been given this opportunity to just stop and look around and people are looking around at what's around them. People are seeing more. And it's not that there's more around. It's just that people have been given this privileged opportunity to, to actually take in what is around them. Um, and as I say, one of the first things when lockdown happened, I remember that stepping into my garden in the evening, it was so quiet. And you could hear birds and you could, uh, and, and things like that. And you could, I could hear the sea and things like that, that, that you can't normally hear because of the background noise of traffic and, and revelers and such like that. So it was, um, yeah, I, I, I think it's just uh, given us an opportunity to open our eyes and be aware of what's around us. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I hope everybody takes away from this is that there is a bigger world around us and we need, we need to take time out to actually stop and look at these things. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. And I think it's given us that time to pause and appreciate the kind of natural world that does surround us, even in the smallest degree, like a tree that's embedded in a, um, a path that we might see, like these small bits of nature um, that we come across. Um, I think we have a question from Dorcas, if you'd like to unmute your microphone. Hi, um, two, two questions, really. Um, the first one is, do we actually know what happened to the, um, to the what, what caused the demise of the passenger pigeons? And um, that's just a personal kind of interest. And the other one is, why do we feel such empathy towards taxidermied um, animals? There you go. Well, uh, I can pick up the uh, passenger pigeon one to start off with. Um, it was once the commonest bird on the planet and uh, its name derives from the fact that um, there were flocks of billions, literally, in North America, and it would pass over. So it was a passenger pigeon, because you'd have these flocks that would take days to pass over. Uh, and when uh, they opened up the West, uh, one of the things that the pioneers had was shotguns. And when you've got these big flocks of pigeons, they're very, very easy to kill. Uh, and you can take several down with a single shot. Um, and they, were, they, they weren't the biggest of birds, but they, they were relatively tasty as pigeons are, but they would use them for feeding pigs. Um, they, they became a, a commodity in that sense. And um, in the breeding grounds, they nested in, um, big communal roosts and they killed so many it got to the point that the remaining groups didn't feel comfortable breeding in small groups so the nesting failed uh, and the what eventually happened was that the population reached a certain point and then collapsed and this is one of the interesting things harking back to the, the films is that technically you could genetically recreate one and uh, we're getting onto the whole topic of de-extinction, which is uh, a whole uh, scary, scary world. Um, but if you reproduced one or two, they wouldn't breed mm. because genetically they breed in huge groups. Um, so you'd have to genetically produce thousands for them to feel comfortable enough to reproduce. But if you were doing that, would you have a big enough genetic variation in the genome to produce viable offspring? So it, it becomes a very, very, very complicated area. And sorry, I've forgotten your second question, Doc. <laughs> the other question was about, um, maybe Lucy, you could take this one, is about why do we have um, empathy for taxidermy? Is that correct, Orcus? Yeah. yeah. 
I mean, I suppose it's uh, the empathy of something not being there. Or, I mean, particularly, I think it's anything that's been hunted. I think that that's particularly or killed in an inhumane way or like the tunny fish and that, you know, the gaming sports, the fox hunting, the kind of the game, big game killing, like all of those, that kind of sense of undeserved loss. But I mean, there's lots of other opinions on, on those topics, but I don't know, is the empathy, um, it's like, a, you know, it's like, why, why is that? I mean, yeah, it's a good question, Dorcas. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just... I guess it's partly to do with the life-likeness, if that's a term, of taxidermy, that idea of... Um, I've watched some videos of taxidermists in their practice and how they're so determined to create something that's um, exactly fulfilling the reality of that animal down to um, the settings that they would be in on a particular branch and often with species that they would interact with or consume so I think often that lifelikeness creates a sort of empathy for them in one degree because um, we're interacting with them as an animal but then there's that second level that we know they're not living there's that sense of death which mm. kind of haunts taxidermy so I think there's almost that kind of sadness that comes with it as well and that sense of mourning that inhabits taxidermy which I think is really curious about it. There's also bad taxidermy as okay. well which is haunting in a different way I think, so I think yeah. some of the pictures I've seen uh, not within your collection but um, yeah that, that kind of conjures up other emotions I'd say. Um, one of the things um, with taxidermy is it's sort of like it, it's it's a, a relatively modern phenomenon in that it was only in Victorian times that they um, came up with a way to preserve the skin so that they wouldn't just rot uh, by adding arsenic, which is why you shouldn't really lick taxidermy. Um, <laughs> please, kids, don't lick the spoon. Um, but it was in the Great Exhibition of 1851 that uh, John Hancock um, of the Hancock Museum, the Great North Museum in um, Newcastle, he was a, a pioneering taxidermist and he was one of the first people to sort of display animals in lifelike poses because prior to that, a lot of taxidermy was literally birds stood up facing left or birds stood up facing right. And he produced these... Um, sort of almost diorama where you'd have an eagle catching a hare or something like that and that really captured people's imaginations um, and it was from that point onwards that people started to look at taxidermy as an art mm. and as far as I'm concerned as, as a, a naturalist taxidermy is an art form mm. um, as I mentioned earlier about study skins you can learn to make study skins in an afternoon to make a, a, a realistic and dramatic taxidermy display takes a lifetime. So it's a, it, it is much more towards the art than the science is taxidermy. And I think that's one of the things that maybe appeals to people. So we've got time for one more question um, before we wrap it up. Um, I'll switch to Rupert's question in the chat, who he has asked, um, he's mentioned the great orc egg and the passenger pigeon, and he wonders whether there's any more extinct bird specimens within the collections. Um, within the Scarden Museum collections, we have, uh, as mentioned, the egg of a great orc. We have, uh, a passenger pigeon, we have three passenger pigeons. Um, they were at one point the commonest bird in the world, so having passenger pigeons isn't particularly surprising. Uh, most museums do have passenger pigeons. We have the egg of a passenger pigeon uh, as well, uh, but we also have a, a pair of huia, which are a New Zealand bird uh, that became extinct in the 1930s. And um, one of the notable things about those is that the male and the female have dramatically different beaks. And one of the reasons they became extinct was also the reason that they had such dramatically different beaks, is that they were living in such a harsh environment that the male and female, the beak adaptation was designed so that they would not be competing for food. 
Um, one has a very thin curved beak and the other has a chisel-like beak. One was for probing for insects and the other was like a woodpecker for pecking out insects. And we, we, we have a pair of those as well. So, mm. there you go. Mm. Thank you, Jim. Um, so I think um, it's come to the end of the screening. So um, if there was any technical difficulties, I do apologise. Um, this was our first one. And I hope you all enjoyed watching the films um, and the Q&A session afterwards. Um, so thank you all for coming. And thank you to Jim and Lucy also for participating in the Q&A. Um, gallery screenings are a monthly thing um, and they happen on the last Tuesday of every month. And um, for the time being, they're going to be virtual. Um, so if you are interested and enjoyed this screening, do pop in um, the last Tuesday of May into your calendar and hopefully see you then.